Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, we're pleased you can join us this morning. I'm Dottie Gallagher, President and CEO of the Buffalo Niagara Partnership, and I'm really pleased you're with us here today to discuss the New York Hero Act, which Governor Cuomo recently signed into law. The bill adds some major requirements onto employers, so it's important that employers learn what these requirements are and how they will affect your workplace. The first requirement is adherence to new workplace safety standards. These standards are designed to limit the spread of infectious disease in the workplace and cover everything from PPE to hand washing to health screening. The other requirement, and perhaps more burdensome one, is the creation of workplace safety committees, which are responsible for identifying potential health problems to employers. Our government affairs team was very active in communicating with legislat legislators as this bill was being considered. We initially opposed the bill because we felt it was unnecessary and unnecessarily burdensome. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our employers have shown a great ability to keep their employees safe. Our employers listened to the CDC and our state and county health officials. They applied public health guidance. They got masks and PPE for their workers, installed plexiglass shields, improved their hand washing stations, uh, developed surface uh, disinfecting protocols, and enforced social distancing. As a result of that, the state's own contact tracing data showed that COVID-19 spread was largely from social gatherings, not in the workplace. So we were very vocal in our opposition to the bill. However, uh, it became clear that the legislature was intent on passing it and the governor was committed to signing it. So at that point, we uh, pivoted a bit and advocated for amendments to the bill that would make it less burdensome and costly to employers. And we're pleased that some of the amendments that the BNP advocated for were included in the final agreement. Now the state departments of labor and health are finalizing detailed regulations related to this law. Uh, we've also weighed in on those regulations to make them as sensible and efficient as possible. With all that being said, the HERO Act is now law and the workplace safety standards go into effect on July 4th. So uh, the BMP felt it was necessary to make you aware of what the law is and what it means for your workplace and give you the opportunity to ask questions uh, around that. Uh, and to do that, we have partnered with Barclay Damon, who was generous enough to lend us one of their experts for this event. And we're very grateful to them for their help and support in making today happen. Our keynote speaker for today is Mr. Bob Heary, Barclay Damon's Labor and Employment Practice Area Chair. Bob advises employers on labor and employment matters, including compliance with applicable laws, labor management relations, and developing employment practices and policies. Bob also represents employers in federal and state court actions and administrative proceedings. He brings more than 25 years of experience to his practice representing employers and their management teams in all aspects of labor and employment law. And we're really glad to have him with us today to help us sort through all of this. Um, please utilize the Q&A feature if you have questions during the event. And if you see a question that looks like the one you've asked, click like so it will move that question to the top of the list. Um, at the end of Bob's remarks, we, we are, we'll be reviewing some commonly asked questions that we've been getting now already from employers, and if, but if time allows, we will certainly take more specific questions from all of you. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, welcome, Bob, and uh, let's hear it. Thank you, Dottie. I appreciate the intro, and thank you, everyone, for uh, spending a little time here this morning with us talking about this new requirement. Um, uh, this is the uh, uh, disclaimer that uh, the firm requires me to provide, um, and I will ask, the, um, ask Darlene to uh, skip over this and jump to the next slide, please, and we can get started. So we're going to talk about the HERO Act. Dottie uh, set the stage, and um, let's, let's dive into it. Um, next slide, please. So the New York Health and Essential Rights, that's where HERO Act comes from, was signed by the governor on May 4th. It originally uh, had an effective date of 30 days after, um, after being signed. Um, there were HERO Act amendments, which were signed on June 11th, 2021. And as Dottie mentioned, that extended the time for the effective of the act until July 4th, July 4th being a federal holiday it, for all practical purposes means July 5th is the date that we're looking at. And Dottie uh, alluded to uh, the fact that there is 
information, guidance, standards forthcoming that will be forthcoming from the New York State Department of Labor. Um, we anticipate that that will be available uh, by July 5th, and um, we don't know exactly what it'll look like, <clears throat> and that's to be determined. So there are some uh, questions that we have uh, received, which the answer is going to be, we don't know until we see what the final standards, the final rules look like. But I think that there are some things that we can start to think about, that employers should start to think about in terms of how they want to approach these new requirements. You know, the HERO Act, um, I think in my view, it is, it is somewhat uh, you know, a reaction to what happened over the course of the last 15 plus months that we've all been dealing with COVID. Um, clearly that's what it is, but it's also a little bit of, of you know, a progressive workplace uh, policies bleeding into legislation. I think it's it, I think it's analogous in some respects to what happened with the uh, New York State sexual harassment uh, requirements that employers had to start dealing with several years ago on the heels of the hashtag Me Too movement. Um, you know, uh, you you were required to adopt a policy. The state developed a model policy. Um, you were required to provide annual training to your employees. You know, the HERO Act has some of those, uh, uh, you know, similar features and a similar feel. Um, and it is, as I said, uh, part of a, 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 an active uh, legislature and uh, government in terms of further regulating the workplace. And we've seen a lot of this over the last several years, right, with the New York State paid sick leave law being one. Uh, that was implemented at the beginning of this year, the New York State paid family leave law, the, um, uh, the, the efforts to move forward with some sort of predictive scheduling legislation. All of this, you know, is a trend that I think will probably continue, uh, at least in the near term. So, you know, the HERO Act probably won't be the last uh, intrusion into the uh, management of businesses by government. Um, let's talk about the HERO Act specifically, though, and uh, what its requirements are. Next slide, please. So the HERO Act, um, it, it, uh, what it did is it added uh, new Section 218B to the New York State Labor Law, and it uh, requires that the Department of Labor in consultation with the Department of Health prepare a model airborne infectious disease exposure standard. And the requirement is that that standard is to be differentiated by industry where appropriate. What does that mean? Um, we're not sure at this point. As I said, we're waiting on what that guidance was going to look like. But you know, we can almost certainly expect that there would be an industry standard related to healthcare. Um, I think that there's no doubt that, that that's going to be the case. Um, there may be different a standard for manufacturing. There may be a standard for, um, you know, restaurant and hospitality. There may be a standard for office uh, locations. I suspect but don't know that the uh, Department of Labor and the Department of Health may build off of or take from the New York forward guidance that has been developed and out there uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic and sort of break things down along those lines. What does that mean? You know, it means on the positive side, Employers have had to deal with the New York Forward guidance, the New York Forward safety plans. The, so there's some familiarity with what is in there. Um, and, and so that is, if they go that route, then that could be, uh, give us a leg up 
in terms of trying to figure out how to plan and comply with whatever the standard is that comes out of it. On the other hand, um, you know, some of the New York Forward uh, guidance was clearly designed for an emergency situation. And as uh, the folks here are probably aware, the governor uh, just yesterday indicated that he is going to let the state of emergency authorization expire um, tomorrow. And so, you know, we, we're moving sort of out of that uh, uh, emergency situation, the executive powers that, that brought all of that New York forward requirements and guidance out of the way as uh, the pandemic's tapered off. So we'll see what comes, but I do think that there will be at least a few uh, different differentiated industry standards and um, we'll see, we'll see uh, come uh, the beginning of next month what those look like. Next slide, please. The model standards are required, uh, will include requirements for, and again, this is, as I just alluded to, the New York Forward guidance and what we've been dealing with for a while now, employee health screenings, face coverings, personal protective equipment, hygiene stations, cleaning and disinfecting. Next slide, please. Social distancing, compliance with orders of quarantine and isolation, engineering controls for ventilation and airflow, designation of supervisory employees responsible to enforce compliance. Next slide, please. Notice requirements to employees and relevant government agency of potential exposures, review of standards, policies, employee rights with um, uh, uh, the employees and the workforce. And again, you know, as we've moved sort of beyond the pandemic, um, at least in New York for now, um, what will it mean? What will the guidance tell us? Well, the guidance, there are certain pieces of this that may simply be we need to have something on the shelf. We need to have the, the, the bones in place in the event of another outbreak of the coronavirus or some other airborne infectious disease. I think that is a, a lot of what the safety plans might look like or the safety plan requirements and guidance. Um, and because as a practical matter, all of those things, for the most part, there's a few things obviously in here that are maybe new and different, but a lot of the things uh, employers have been walking away from over time as things have been loosening up. So we less, less concern about masking, less concern about social distancing, more concern about getting people into the office, more concern about um, you know, how, how can we have a business meeting where everybody can sit in the same room and talk to each other and not have masks on and those sorts of things, you know, we've moved along um, beyond uh, certain of the things that I think will be in the standards, but we'll see again to be determined. Next slide, please. So what else does New York labor law section 218 require? The employer must adopt and implement airborne infectious disease exposure plan. The plan must be distributed to employees. The plan must be posted at the work site. The plan must incorpor be incorporated into the employee handbook and the plan must be available for review by the Department of Labor should they come in and conduct an inspection and, uh, and the like. So, you know, again, what might the plan look like? We don't know. The standard may be um, one which employers uh, look at and say, look, I, I'm just going to adopt this model plan because that's the path of least resistance. That's the easiest thing for me to do. And again, going back to my analogy of the New York State sexual uh, harassment requirements, some employers looked at the model sexual harassment policy that was um, published by the state and said, you know what, 
I'm just going to adopt this. This is easy. This is the path of least resistance. I don't need to think about this. I don't need to spend lawyer, money on my lawyer to, to, to do something different. I can simply adopt this wholesale. Other employers, you know, didn't think that was the greatest policy. They, um, they wanted to have their own policy. They uh, did not want to adopt wholesale the policy, the, the, the prototype policy that had been issued by the state. And each employer is going to have to make that decision and make that decision based upon the nature of their operations, their workforce, um, uh, and, and so on. Next slide, please. So employers may adopt relevant model standards or an alternative airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plan. And it has to meet or exceed those minimum standards that are gonna be published by the state. And here's, here's the sort of the rub. Any alternative plan shall be developed with collective bargaining representatives or meaningful participation of employees where there is no bargaining representative. Those are undefined in terms of what it means to have meaningful participation of employees where there is no bargaining representative. So unlike the New York State sexual harassment requirement that I keep referencing, which employers had sort of free reign as long as they met the requirements of, of, the, of the statute, they had free reign to adopt a policy um, as they chose to. Here, an alternative plan has to be developed with a collective bargaining representative or meaningful participation of employees where there is no bargaining representative. And that is that may be a challenge for employers. It may lead employers to, um, again, opt for the path of least resistance and adopt the model that is published by the state. Now, if the model looks anything like the New York forward safety plans, which the state published, I will tell you that I personally was not a fan of those templates and, and prototypes. Um, certainly we had uh, clients of ours that that simply use them because that was the easiest way to get a safety plan in place. Others took elements of the uh, state plan and adopted it into their own, you know, individualized safety plan for their workplace. That was what we recommended for our clients uh, because, again, we we weren't necessarily fans of the prototypes. I don't know whether or not the um, the prototype that comes out with the HERO Act will resemble those New York forward safety plans. Um, but if it does, as I said, I, I, I'm not so excited about that. But if you have to sit down with a collective bargaining representative and develop an alternative program with that representative, that just may not be something that an employer is interested in doing, at least at this particular time. And maybe particularly if they don't have an open contract, or maybe if they do have an open contract, um, is it something that labor management, if you have a labor management committee process, could take up at one of their meetings? You know, there's a lot of things to think about in terms of looking at alternative plans. And if you're a non union employer, how do you have meaningful participation of employees if there's no bargaining representative? Well, maybe you have a safety committee uh, already that has some employee representation, and maybe that might be a way that you uh, could look at and develop a plan which is specific to your organization. But maybe you don't, and maybe you don't want to or have the time to create the infrastructure to develop such a plan. Again, decisions to be made at the individual employer level based upon the employer's workforce, the employer's operations, the culture of the employer, the existing um, 
uh, processes that the employer has in place. Next slide, please. So under, and this goes to the timing issue that I just talked about, employers need to adopt these prevention plans within 30 days after the Department of Labor publishes its model standards. And they must provide the safety plan to the employees within 60 days after the DOL publishes the model safety standards. So we've got a very you know, compact time frame that we're going to be looking at in order to get these safety plans uh, uh, in place and published out to the employees. And so, again, path of least resistance may very well be to adopt the model plan in the, in the first instance and decide on a longer term view whether or not you want to revisit what is in the model plan. Um, the, uh, so the timing, you know, we expect these model standards to be out either that week just before um, the 4th of July holiday or on July 5th. So, you know, we have just about five weeks to develop our, model, our, 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 our prevention plan. And then we have um, another, you know, 30 days after that to get it out to the employees. Next slide, please. So a couple of other things that are built into the uh, labor law section 218B requirements um, that employees are protected from exercising their rights or reporting violations uh, or concerns. So um, yet another uh, avenue of, of protection for employees related to um, protected activity, you know, coming forward with uh, concerns about safety, safety violations. Now, you know, is this something to really get excited about? Um, you know, I guess it depends on, on the, uh, the nature of what the employees are bringing forward. You know, will this open the floodgates of employees coming and uh, nitpicking every little thing that they might take issue with in some workplaces? Probably the answer is yes. In others, you know, it, it, there may not be much of a change at all. Um, you know, you, you may have already in place a safety culture that encourages employees to come forward and report near miss uh, incidents and to come up with suggestions for improving safety in the workplace. And this may really not be much of a change at all, because if you have those types of safety protocols, then you are already uh, aware of um, the importance of not retaliating against somebody who comes forward with a concern about safety. And, you know, we already have protections under OSHA. There are protections under the NLRA for concerted protected activity, even in a non-union setting. And somebody who's bringing forward safety concerns on behalf of a group of employees is, you know, protected under the NLRA. We already have whistleblowing uh, protections um, that are built into the law. So, you know, it's not unusual for the legislature to have included this protection. It's also probably not um, something to get really excited about. Um, the next one refusing to work where the employee reasonably believes in good faith that the work exposes the employee, coworkers, the public to unreasonable risk of exposure due, con due to conditions inconsistent with an applicable law, rule, or order. Again, uh, you know, it probably depends on the workplace and the workforce. Um, uh, uh, employees in the context of um, represented workforce, you know, that's one of the exclusions, right, in terms of an employee's refusal to, to work. The, the, the rubric is work now, grieve later, unless there is a real safety concern. 
in which case an employee could refuse to work and would be protected. Um, you know, are there going to be employees who may play some gamesmanship? There might be. Um, but again, as we advised employers throughout the pandemic, and uh, the, the sort of a generalized fear of contagion. That's not what we're talking about. There has to be something that is specific that the employee would be able to point to in order to refuse to work. And um, I, you know, employers have been dealing with some of those examples uh, during the pandemic and um, have, have had to deal with this issue of employees raising safety concerns, um, even outside of airborne infectious disease for, for, for years. So, you know, I think, I think this, is, um, this, is, this is a new, again, protection, but what is the practical import of it? I'm not sure it's going to be huge. I do think you will have you know, you already know who that employee is in your workforce who's going to try to push the boundaries of this, um, and and uh, you know we'll just have to we'll just have to manage those situations as they arise. Next slide, please. Um, Section 218B also provides that the New York State Department of Labor may investigate violations and assess uh, civil penalties. Those civil penalties, um, as the statute is written, is a civil penalty of not less than $50. So it, 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 the statute itself doesn't, um, doesn't impose a significant civil penalty, but it doesn't also, it doesn't at this point in time include any sort of a cap. What we don't know is whether or not the standard might include um, a, a penalty matrix of some sort, um, kind of uh, what we've seen from OSHA at different times with, um, with their penalty matrix. Is there something like that that might be coming from New York State DOL? My own guess is probably not. Um, my guess is that what we will find is that civil penalties, you know, we'll learn about what the Department of Labor's appetite for civil penalties is as they move forward with compliance under the statute. I could end up being surprised and they may, um, they may uh, publish a penalty matrix, but we'll see. There's also a limited private right of action for employees. And um, we have a question uh, that's been posed a little bit uh, later in the, in the presentation. I'll talk a little more about that private right of action when we get to that slide. Um, next slide, please. The other component of the HERO Act is the uh, uh, adoption of New York Labor Law Section 27D. Employers employing at least 10 employees must permit, must permit, not required to have, but must permit establishment of Joint Labor Management Workforce Safety Committee. And the composition of that Joint Labor Management Safety Committee is two thirds non-supervisory employees. Next slide, please. So the employee members are to be selected by and from among non-supervisory employees. A collective bargaining uh, representative, if there is one, is uh, responsible for selection of employee members. And the safety committee is to be co-chaired by an employer representative and a non-supervisory employee. So, um, so that's uh, the sort of the, uh, sorry, my light just went out because I haven't moved. Um, that's, that's sort of the, that's the requirement. And that is what these safety committees will look like. Now, again, um, the safety committees going to the, 
the permit, the permissive nature of the requirement. Employers, again, are going to have to make decisions based upon their workforce, their safety culture, uh, their operations as to how they might consider implementing this. The safety committee uh, requirement is, uh, is further out. We don't have to deal with this until um, November. But, you know, one of, some of the things that I think employers should start thinking about is, okay, this says we have to permit a safety committee. Is my organization one that wants to simply see what happens? I'm not required to, to, to uh, uh, implement a safety committee. I'm required to allow or permit one to uh, exist. So, you know, if I'm a small not-for-profit employer or a small for-profit employer, let's say I have, you know, 15, 20 employees, you know, do I want to go through and figure out what kind of a safety committee might make sense or not make sense and try to shape what that might look like, or do I just want to wait and see what happens? And, and maybe no employee comes forward and says, hey, you know what, we think we ought to have a safety committee here uh, at, at our workplace. Will the standard sort of suggest that notwithstanding the permissive language that is in the statute, that there really is an affirmative requirement on employers to implement a safety committee. We don't know that. We'll have to see what the standard says when it comes out. Um, if you're an employer who already has a safety committee, but the composition and the selection process is not what is required under the HERO Act, maybe you want to consider tweaking that safety committee in order to try to, um, you know, make it quote compliant uh, with the requirements of the HERO Act. Um, if you don't have a safety committee, maybe, and we'll see what the regulations say because this might not work, but here's one of the things that, that I've thought about, you know, as an employer, maybe you want to get ahead of this. Maybe what you want to do is say, you know what, I don't want to run the risk of the union coming to us and saying, oh, we need to have a safety committee or some group of disgruntled employees coming to me and saying, oh, you know what, we, uh, we all got together and uh, we elected these 10 people to be on the safety committee. Um, so tell us, tell us who your representative is and then we can start meeting. Uh, you know, if you, maybe we don't want to face that eventuality. And if the regulations allow for it and we can shape the safety committee, uh, maybe getting out in front of it might make sense. Maybe what we want to do as an employer is say, you know what, we're going to have a safety committee. We don't have one now, but we're going to have a safety committee here at uh, the XYZ company. And our safety committee is going to be five people. We're going to have three people who are selected from among the employees and we'll figure out a process for how that's going to happen. And then we're going to have two representatives from the employer who will be on that safety committee. So now we've, we've, we've got our two thirds, right? 60, 40. Um, now I guess we'd have to do one more. Um, it's not quite two thirds. So, we we uh, we maybe so maybe it's six or but what but we keep it small, and we develop the process for the selection of the employees, and we get as I said kind of get ahead of it. We we uh, have our production manager and our safety person be the company representatives on that committee, and then we have a number of employees, or or we have a committee of three you know, two employees and, and our production manager or our safety manager. Um, things to think about. 
Again, the regulations may provide more guidance and, and be more strict, uh, but I, I think these are the things that you can start planning for and thinking about what makes sense for your business. Next slide, please. Safety committee is authorized to raise health and safety concerns, review policies relating to occupational safety and health, review the adoption of policies in response to health and safety laws, rules, regulations, and participate in site visits by governmental agencies enforcing health and safety standards. Um, next slide, please. Safety committee is authorized to do the following, review any reports filed by an employer related to health and safety, that's with, you know, with government agencies, and to regularly schedule meetings um, one time per quarter for a maximum of two hours. So these are some of the amendments that uh, originally there, there was no maximum uh, period of time. Um, it was open and undefined uh, per permit Permit, again, the word permit, not require, but permit safety committee designees to attend training maximum of four hours without loss of pay. Um, again, these are things, we'll see what the regulations look like on the back end and what we can uh, reasonably do. But perhaps, perhaps again, the employer might wanna take control of that and figure out what safety training um, committee members might go through and how they might uh, end up adopting this. As I said, you know, if you're a big, sophisticated employer, you have an EHS function that is already uh, well developed and robust, you may just tweak the program you have, or you may feel comfortable that what you have in place is low risk for any group of employees attempting to disrupt your current safety program. And you might just say, you know what? We're gonna leave things unchanged. We're comfortable with what we've got in place. Again, we'll see what the regulations say, but the statute on its face would suggest that you could make that decision unless uh, there was some collective effort on the part of the employees to uh, bring about a different type of a safety committee with different representation. And frankly, if you had that, you probably got bigger problems uh, aside from your safety committee. Next slide, please. Here are the questions. Uh, again, some of these have come up from uh, 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 conversations that the folks at the partnership have had with members. And so we thought it would be good to kind of run through uh, a few of these. Uh, my business operates three factories in the area. Is one workplace safety committee for my business sufficient or do I need separate workplace safety committees for each site? So the answer is, um, is not clear from the regulation or from the statute. Uh, the, 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 the statute defines the work site as being, you know, these separate sites and locations of employment. Um, the regula or the, the statute itself says you're required or you can have, you know, you're limited to one committee per work site. So that's the limitation. Are you required to have one committee per work site? The answer is, you know, not necessarily under the under the rules uh, or, or under the statute. Again, do you, you have to permit one per site and no more than one per site. So um, I, I think that again, it's every employer should be assessing their operations and figuring out what makes sense for them based upon the nature of their operations. And there's some, you know business decisions to be made in terms of risk. Um, and, and I've alluded to those in the context of the, of the program. Uh, next, next slide, we have another question. So an employee contracts COVID and claims that work is the only place they could have come in contact with it. Can my business be held liable for it? 
And we've had these situations come up in the context of the pandemic, right? Um, uh, COVID to the extent that it is a workplace exposure, uh, it would be a workers' comp claim and covered under workers' comp. The standard for uh, demonstrating that the exposure was a workplace exposure and uh, obtaining comp benefits has, is very high. Um, as, as Dottie mentioned, one of the things that we know is that spread in the workplace is, is not the primary source of spread of the COVID infection. It's community-based, it has been community-based. And um, while I don't uh, practice in the workers' compensation arena, um, my understanding is that the, uh, the, the claims for, and proving a claim for COVID exposure in the workplace is uh, very difficult to, to meet from a liability perspective. And as, we, as we move on to the next question, I just wanna remind everyone, you can submit a question in the Q&A and there are a handful of questions in there right now. And if you see one that looks like a question you want answered, if you would like it, and we'll move that question to the top of the list because we, we've got 15 minutes left. So we wanna to get to some of those questions, uh, Bob. So go ahead, keep going. Oh, okay, thanks, Dottie. Uh, my workplace uh, safety committee, comes to me with a concern about a potentially hazardous condition in our office. How should I respond to their concern uh, to keep them safe and minimize my potential liability? So uh, I think what you need to do if, if when we get to this point in time is what we would do uh, without a safety committee. You know, if an employee came forward with a safety concern, what should we do? We should do a hazard assessment. Is, is there a hazard that is presented by the condition that the employee has noted? Is there a corrective action that needs to be taken with respect to the hazard that's been identified? Or is it not really a hazard at all? Um, and then document what it is that we did as part of addressing the concern that came forward, uh, either, either our assessment that it really was not a hazardous condition or corrective action that we took in order to address the hazard. You know, the guard is off of the punch press in the shop. Okay, let's assess that hazard. Yes, the guard's off. Let's get maintenance to put it back on. You know, we have ways of handling these things, um, documenting them. It's gonna be different again, depending upon the employer and the workplace, but it's, it's um, review the concern, assess the concern, take corrective action if necessary. Next slide, please. The bill contains a private right of action. What does that mean? And under what circumstances can I be sued? And this is an area where the amendments, I think uh, really uh, are beneficial and helpful to the employer. So there was, real, there was originally this concept of a private right of action for employees to be able to come forward and make complaints about um, uh, safety issues in the workplace and, and pursuing those complaints in the form of a civil action. And uh, what, what the amendments do is that they provide for a notice and cure period. So if an employee has a safety concern before they can bring a civil action, they need to give the employer notice of what that safety concern is the employer has, they have to wait a period of 30 days, which allows the employer to address the safety concern if there is one. And on top of it, the uh, amendments provide that if the claim brought by the employee is found by the court to be a frivolous claim, then the employee can be liable to the employer for the employer's fees and costs. On the other hand, if the employer um, you know, there's a safety issue which is not addressed by the employer, the employee in the civil action can also uh, uh, recover potentially attorney's fees and costs. So um, it's, this goes back to question that just we just talked about. Safety concern comes forward. We need to take it seriously. We need to address it. We need to document. Next question, please. 
Can I be held liable for a violation the Workplace Safety Committee did not bring to my attention? Uh, the answer is uh, certainly. Um, you know, the laws of negligence don't go away just because there is this new statute. If, if we uh, operate a retail establishment and there is some unsafe condition at that retail establishment and a customer comes in and it's a trip hazard and they fall and break an arm, break a nose, um, that sort of thing. And the fact that the safety committee didn't bring it forward is not going to protect us from liability. Similarly, if there is the my machine guarding example, um, the um, if my, if the uh, machine is not guarded and nobody on the safety committee brought it to our attention, but somebody gets a finger uh, chopped off we're still going to be liable for the OSHA citation that comes later on. So yes, there can still be some liability, notwithstanding the fact that uh, Workplace Safety Committee didn't uh, raise the issue. Next slide, please. An employee tells me he will not be coming to work today because he believes there is an unreasonable risk of exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace. What action can I take? Again, we talked about this earlier on, generalized fear of contagion is not um, a reason to refuse to come to work. And, um, you know, employers have been dealing with this throughout the pandemic, more so now that we've gotten to the reopening phase and people are bringing employees back to the office. We do have obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and, and so we, we do have to be mindful of whether or not there is a condition which may implicate the idea of having to work remotely, um, because now we've demonstrated that a lot of people can work remotely. Um, but as a general proposition, um, if our workplace, if our employees are vaccinated or a good number of them are vaccinated or we have uh, protocols, people have been required to come back to the office. And now, as I said, with the emerge, state of emergency expiring you know, tomorrow, um, I really think a lot of this issue ends up coming off the table. Next, please. Uh, before we do question seven, I know we've got 10 total questions. Um, I, want, I want to interject one question that 17 people have voted up and it's so it's just, okay and, and my entire time of doing these webisodes 50 or so we've never gotten 17 votes on any questions so um i this is, is a hot topic and the question is will this act require daily health screening of all employees even though the governor lifted that restriction will it codify the cdc guidelines on non-vaccinated employees wearing masks the and the answer is we do not know, Dottie. Uh, I wish I wish I did know. I wish. They, so, Bob, do you think this, when the regulations come out, that this will be addressed, or do you, or do you not think it will be? Or do you, you know? I guess there's really no way to. I'm asking you to predict what they're going to do, and that's always challenging. The problem, the problem that I think uh, employers have faced, Dottie, uh, you know, currently, and and maybe even when we get this guidance is is this this thing that has happened over the last couple of months where the governments go like this yeah. you get this you know he, here's what we say but we don't really want to say that anymore Just look what the cdc says and the cdc has some you know not really hard and fast clear guidance they've got some stuff but um and i i don't know if it's going to be sort of soft and squishy or if it's going to be hard. My suspicion is it will not be hard guidance. I don't think the government wants to be in that. The government of New York doesn't want to necessarily be in that business at this point in the pandemic. So my suspicion is uh, and my suspicion is that it will be very much along the lines of what we have now, which is, well, OK, it's kind of unclear what mm. what, uh, what exactly employers should be doing, right? I mean, are you monitoring vaccination status? Are you not monitoring vaccination status? Are you 
you know, are you using an honor system in terms of vaccine or not vaccine? You know, masking, social distancing. You know, a lot of employers have said, I'm throwing up my hands. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to ask people their vaccination status. I'm just going to post a sign that says, if you're not vaccinated, wear a mask and, you know, maintain social distance. Um, other employers are very adamant about knowing the vaccination status of people and enforcing a mask requirement or um, that sort of thing in the workplace. And neither one is necessarily wrong from a, you know, from a compliance perspective based on the guidance that's out there at this point. Mm -hmm. Let's take one more of these, then we'll go back to the the standard questions uh, because in this one has 12, has 12 votes. Um, do you anticipate that components of this plan will only be in effect during a state of emergency or a period of time during a community-wide transmission, uh, essentially turning this into a this uh, law into a contingency emergency preparedness plan that organizations will use as a reference only when needed? And I know that. Uh, so, Bob, what's your opinion of, about that? Um, I, I I suspect. I suspect that the plan itself will be very much that, Dottie. It will be more of a contingency plan. The safety committee requirement thing, though, that is not going to be a contingency type of thing. Um, and again, the plan itself is one that you have to provide to employees um, uh, within uh, uh, the time periods that I reference, you also have to provide it to new hires when they come on. You're also going to have to put it in your employee handbook if you have an employee handbook. So it, it's going to be out there and part of the employer's onboarding and safety process and that sort of thing. But I think by and large, um, it, it, it is going to be a contingency plan in the event that you know the Delta variant becomes the breakthrough variant, or some new strain becomes a breakthrough variant, or you know there's some new infectious disease, airborne infectious disease. The interesting thing is that all of this is limited to you know airborne infectious diseases, and before we had COVID, you know everybody was worried about Ebola, you know which is a bloodborne disease, you know, um, which never took off, thank goodness. But, it, you know, this is related to, I think, contingency so that there's greater preparedness for the next time, I think. So yeah, I, I, we're, we're hearing some of that as well. Of course, this is, I, I think, until the regulatory, you know, standard comes out, it's, you know, uh, it could go any which way. We don't, we, you know, right. we certainly don't want to predict what the state is going to do. That would be a, you know, that's like gambling in Las Vegas. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I would say this, though, I think that there'll be a lot more clarity around some of these issues when the regulations come out. So, we have been thinking yes. about should we be doing another a webinar when the regulations come out? So uh, we'd love to hear from the people on the call, just in the chat, just let us know, yes, no, I'd be interested in, in, in another session around interpreting the regulations when they are when they are done. We'll take your feedback uh, as well. So, so Bob, we've got five minutes to get through these last three questions and the remaining questions in the chat, we will get to Bob and those people who have asked them, we will get you an answer. Uh, but I wanna make sure that we get through these 10 questions, Bob. So so you got, you got about a minute of question. Uh, it is required that I consult with my employees union in developing my workplace safety plan. If my employees do not have a collective bargaining organization, do I need to include, include employee input? So, um, you know, this is sort of just reiterating the point that I made earlier on, which is, yeah, the collective bargaining agent representative has to be involved in developing the workplace safety plan or if unrepresented employees who do not have collective bargaining uh, uh, representation need to be included if, if the employer is deviating from the model plan. So again, the way the statute is written, it suggests, and again, we, don't, we haven't seen the final version but, of the regs, but it suggests that if you simply adopt wholesale, whatever it is that the state publishes as the model or the standard, 
then you don't have to get employee input or go uh, deal with your collective bargaining uh, agent. So Great. now some collective bargaining uh, units, you know, uh, unions may come forward and say, we want to bargain about the safety plan. And we want to, that's a conversation for another day. But um, next question, I'm running out of time. Does an employer have an ability to sign off on, agree to the employee serving on the workforce safety committee? So the way the statute is written, the employer is not allowed to interfere, so to speak, with the selection process, but it doesn't, what it doesn't say in the statute, and we'll see what the regs say, what it doesn't say, though, is that the employer is forbidden or cannot establish the process by which the employees might be selected to be on the committee. And so, as I had alluded to earlier, one of the things employers might want to think about doing is crafting what the size of that committee might look like. Um, maybe, you know, if you're, uh, if you're at a construction site, you know, you've got, maybe you want a, a safety committee at each construction site with the composition of which is going to be the site manager, one employee representative from selected from among the foreman on the job. I've got two. So one of them is going to be on and one from among the laborers on the job. And now I've got my two thirds of employee representatives. I've got the site manager, I've got a foreman and I've got um, you know, my representative of the employees. Again, might, may or may not be uh, allowed. State publishes a safety standard that is tedious. Employees complain about it. Management and the union agree the standard is unnecessary. Do we have any ability to ignore this standard? At your peril. <laughs> <laughs> like like an OSHA standard, right? Um, once the standard's published, we're going to have to figure out how we comply with the standard. Next question. Uh, Governor Cuomo announced he's lifting the state's COVID restrictions. Will the HERO Act uh, regs apply now that COVID-19 restrictions have ended? To be, to be determined. Um, we'll see when the, when the rules come out um, shortly. Daddy? Bob, that was amazing. You, 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 you did it. And we, as I said, we've mentioned, uh, we will get back to some of the specific questions that some of you have asked. Uh, the partnership has a series of events. We'd love to see you all at, at any of them. Uh, the, the one on the 15th about legalized cannabis and the workplace is going to be interesting. And the, read the Sunday paper uh, this week to, ta to hear about uh, a webinar we did about the economic opportunity uh, around cannabis in our region as well. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we, I want to thank you, Bob, and thank Barkley Damon for, uh, for your support and for all the information you've shared with our, with our members and to everyone who's participated. Uh, we will come back at you at some point and, and do another session when the, when the regulations come out and the plans need to be put in place. So thank you all, and thank you, Bob, uh, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Take Todd. care.